So here's the stat, huh? In Premier League, 180 minutes this season, Arsenal defense has held City to zero goals, basically. A total of zero XG and Haaland has basically been nullified. So I think Arteta and Arsenal's defense are right up there amongst one of the best in the world at this point of time. Both the rest defense, every player working hard. Also, City haven't scored for the first time since 2020 at home in 57 games. Yeah, I think it went just as about as I expected it. I wasn't really hoping for us to win because I know it's going to be very difficult. And just like the entire season, our defense has been impeccable. Saliba and Gabriel had Haaland totally under control. And I think our attack could have done better. There was this one opportunity which I think Trussard should have given it to Martinelli. Apart from that, I don't think we failed in converting much opportunities. We didn't get all that many opportunities. So to top it off, I would say that I'm somewhat happy with this result. And I think Arsenal are coming out in a better position compared to City. And recovering from the trauma from the previous season, I I would say I'm really happy with the fact that we beat City twice this season and drew the game at Etihad. So. It's, it's huge. We got 8 points out of possible 12 against our title rivals. So, yeah. I mean, that says a lot for the progress that we've made in the past season. Last season, especially, like the way we crumbled two fixtures in close proximity against City. First was, I think we were in the game until we basically threw it away with like Tommy Asu's mistake. And then in the second half, we just crumbled at home. And then at Eddie had, we were just in a negative momentum. We had lost. We have I, drawn. I don't think we crumbled in the first game against City. Actually, don't we think had so? more position. Yeah, we had more position. I think it was just like two mistakes. That's it. Yeah. And even if we finish second the season, I think we can conclude that it's much better to crumble in the middle than towards the end. Yeah, yeah. At least we can end the season on a good note. And Arteta surely learned from that mistake, right? Like we've seen Arteta being aggressive against City, mm-hmm. like trying to match them toe to toe, which he kind of did at, at Emirates where, I mean, we still were defensive in our approach, but we weren't like, you know, going gung-ho. But today mm-hmm. we were like completely locked out. The defense was like, you know, no, nothing is getting past. They had the position session but we were kind of like you know reducing them to like just passing around the box rotating the ball from like one flank to another but no real penetration yeah but at the same time it didn't feel like the game was out of our hands it yeah. felt like it was you know it was still in control don't you don't and... you think it's a tactic switch Arteta for the first time came to Etihad like trying to be slightly more defensive than hmm. like he didn't try to take on City at their own game like he was there, there were moments where Arsenal players were happy to like not press high up that pitch because yeah. they wanted they knew I mean, that like, literally had... we got a yellow card right for time yeah. wasting yeah in the 67th <laughs> minute or something for Raya like that was too early in the game for a time wasting yellow card and at 0-0 but like it didn't feel like that I feel like um man-to-man marking Arsenal had it covered and it was a completely different strategy it was like I'm gonna go there I know that I'm gonna trust my defense more than my attack and if it works out it works out and uh, I mean you guys you guys sat here and complained uh, United drawing at uh, Liverpool at Anfield and like now here coming and praising almost a similar performance I get it in the grand scheme of things it is a lot more this thing but it was a you know it was going there and setting yourself draw is enough but like, we didn't do that against Liverpool, did we? we yeah. Didn't, even at Anfield. So, it's, City so, is a totally different animal. So He's maturing. Like, Arsenal, Arteta knows that this fixture, coming out of this with a draw is still good enough. But L mm-hmm. is too bad. And he stood. Saliba was outstanding. I was, was going to say Saliba and Gabriel, right? I think more than being satisfied with the draw, it's about trusting your abilities, right? In With the matchups that you face within a particular fixture. So, I mean, he was trusting Kivior. Kivior was pretty shaky. Like, I would admit, in the first 10 minutes, I was like, you know, what is this dude doing? It's going to be like a Tommy Asu moment from last season but he recovered like he made some good passes he was running through the flanks to support Gabriel Jesus whenever very seldomly though we went ahead and uh, Gabriel Magaires and Saliba man like I think I don't think one survives without the other at this point I'm like happy to say that I think Saliba is world class but so is Gabriel man like he and fights he duels he does everything like last season you remember the city players were getting to our head right like there was, there was a psychological warfare going on but this time around I think we got the better of them especially Gabriel and what he was doing with Haaland <laughs> yeah. I mean <laughs> Even, Dude, even, I, I, even Gabby Jesus like was fucking with uh, Haaland. Yeah. yeah. Did you guys see what happened after the game? 
Pep had to come and intervene between uh, Gabriel and Haaland. And then, like, a minute later, they made up. No, after they made up. But in between, Pep had to come and separate them. I love the fight. You remember the times of, like, Sayyad Kolasinak and, like, I don't even know, Mustafi and all these people. Like, who were just like, what is this? Who 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 is this?
like doing really good holding on to the ball in fact he was pushing like he was pushing off two three players at once so but i was kind of surprised but is that kdb's role though i mean in a seri team he was restricted to that like he no, could like, do isn't anything right rodri or like someone like bernardo or kovac has played right those three hmm. so aren't those three are the recyclers of like bringing the ball from defense to mid holding it up and then kdb runs through the channel like his favorite pass is through the right wing right doing crossing into haland or like whoever it is and then they do something either it's a tap in or did you do, feel like he was in that kind of position today where you felt no, no, like that's oh, what he could played that pass that's what i'm saying like because of the physicality of the game he had to protect the hmm. ball more so that extra half a second that you can get as a player if the game is not physical he didn't get it and as soon as it became Maybe. a little bit physical like especially yeah. in the second half he was completely like you know couldn't do anything like uh, foden wasn't in the game okay let's do this foden versus saka win both oh yeah <laughs> foden was there today right? i totally <laughs> forgot but foden i didn't notice him at all foden yeah foden so, yeah, he was the most informed player coming into this match right he was yeah he was yeah i mean between both the teams foden most... and kovacic like both of these guys disappeared yeah Kovacic was still doing something like he was like protecting the defense or like being a part mm. of like you know playing the ball out of the back but Foden I have no idea if he played I really am curious to see his heat map on the pitch what it was how it went and like you know what he did I mean he didn't do anything he wasn't mentioned once uh, throughout the game for me the bigger problem was Haaland was completely not there bro he was absent and like he was actually causing negative problems to the team by missing like some easy shit mm-hmm. so alvarez was on the bench right like or yeah. was he why was was picked up yeah why i was, was concerned he... when i saw like, him warming up i was actually concerned thing, the thing that bothers me is what you know abinov mentioned that like this is the last place where like you know top 3 can have a say in each other's race and everyone decided that like oh if everyone wins the rest of the nine games which is a high probability of happening given how good these teams are they would come back and regret this afternoon like i mean more than liverpool i think city will regret like not doing some of those things like because they were also happy to take a draw and i think um, they could have tried more things they just did not pep didn't get his tactics right Like exactly. Have, yeah. no, sorry, go ahead. No, no, that's it. Like Pep just didn't get his tactics right. I feel like he should have used his bench better. Like there exactly. were anything, and he got in uh, Doku, bro. Like I don't think game needed Doku. I, I think game needed more people for KDB to like, deliver that ball to because Haaland was actually being negative in the game. No, no. I was just saying the same thing, right? I mean, this is the one chance which, again, given where City are right now, City are three points behind Liverpool, right? And I think if they had won the game, the advantage they could have gotten, and I think how they could just let just go, with, just I couldn't understand, right? Like you are playing at home to Arsenal, and how are you not taking advantage of the other situation and not making an impact on the title race at that point? It's just something which I didn't think City would do because there is a better chance of Liverpool and Arsenal losing points as a game. Games go on anyway, and City can actually take the risk. And I just couldn't like, okay, Arsenal are playing conservatively. That part I get it. But what happened to City? You are playing at home, and you're not even kind of servicing your attackers. It's just something which kind of just blew my mind. But but uh, but our defense was doing a really good job. Yeah. Like they yeah. were totally like subduing everything that was going on up front. So like Haaland Haaland never had any like decent opportunity except for like when there was a corner or there was like total confusion inside the box. Apart from that, like you can see that the man marking was done really well in this game. I mean, both Saliba and Gabriel did a really good job. Yeah. And I think and this ahead, is the best defense in the league right now right the least amount of goals conceded so yeah. you do have to consider all these things yeah, yeah I think ahead. we always mention and sometimes we forget to mention because he's so good but I think a lot of city midfield was negated by Declan Rice like I remember three instances where clearly KDB turned and he was about to spray that killer pass that he generally does like receiving the ball maybe like running with the ball a little bit or like just receiving and shooting springing it off to the wings but every time Rice was there like with his leg outstretched tackle and just either taking mm. the ball away or at least making him take an extra touch which kind of helped other people to come into play so i think he did really well but also with these kind of matches right especially with arteta and pep they both are so similar they know each other so well that and, and also their teams operate in a similar manner so it kind of becomes a cagey affair all the time like if you see at emirates it was really cagey if you see at community shield it was a pretty bad watch <laughs> if not into tactics it's mostly like a, a game or like you know a platform for them to showcase their tactical now okay i can do this i can throw that i can do blah 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 doesn't matter what players do doing or what they can do we can do this and they they kind of like go by that which is again fair to them at least it has got us four points and a mickey mouse cup out of it so i won't be grudge at it for doing it but uh, 
go but ahead. no before we wrap let's just at least look at what key fixtures like each of these teams are because today was a very like like you said i think every time these two face it's going to be like a great like a loss yeah. it's going to be like such a you know it's going to be painful to watch for the new yeah. because like you can yeah. go take a walk come back it will just be the same <laughs> <laughs> just like this match you know, is Everyone Sorry. marking each other and like everyone's just technically so on top of the game that it makes such a dull fun yeah. fest. <laughs> yeah, it's it was a hard watch. It was a hard watch for sure. Uh, but but this match is this match yeah. is more played in Pep's and Arteta's heads than on the pitch. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it's it's just kind of they keep making all of these grand assumptions. Okay, what if he does this three moves from now? <laughs> then I will do this two moves from there. So it, it's it's all, it's all very proactive football. I mean, you don't yeah. have to be reactive, but you don't have to be too proactive as well. At least kind of you know just kind of take it as it go. But it yeah. just kind of keeps happening in their heads so much. We are just kind of we are exposed to what's happening in their heads, and it's a very dark. <laughs> so, I'll so tell you one thing though. I'll tell you one thing. It's not so dull for a fan to be watching it. Like mm-hmm. I can easily see why you guys like. For me, I enjoyed the whole yeah, yeah. game. Like, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm totally done from a, from a neutral perspective, right? Because mm-hmm. if if it was Liverpool and everything, I'd be singing a different song. I'm like, okay, yeah, whatever. We got a point. We're fine. We went very hard and everything. Awesome. But from a neutral perspective, when I look at this match, and I was just hoping that there'll be some excitement, at least like the last Arsenal City match. I mean, the four one obviously it was bad for you guys. It was good in that sense. Like at least there was something. But this match was like this is this is one of those Chelsea Liverpool matches of Benitez and Mourinho era, like where. <laughs> Just kind of keep. We knew it was going to be zero zero. That's Ter- it. Terror, terror is ball at his best. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like they were out of twenty two people, they were like what eight centre backs and two defense, four defensive midfielders. So <laughs> what do you expect? It's like proper <laughs> grid lockdown. Nobody is going through anywhere on the goal. So. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, but this rolls up into Liverpool. A great, great result for Liverpool, top of the table. I think two <laughs> points clear, one point clear, two points clear right now. I don't even remember. Uh, yeah, I think we're two points clear two of points. Yeah, Arsenal two points. three of it, three we players. Were, we were yeah, level exactly. before yeah. this week, mm-hmm. so now it's in game points. coming from behind win. Uh, <laughs> I think you got behind in the second, third minute. Danny Welbeck, yeah. pretty good goal, and then to obviously providing one, assisting one. Mm-hmm. He's back to his best, maybe. A scary times. Are you going to do it? I don't know, man. I mean, I think again at this point it's just going to be game by game. I mean, if you look at this game, this is going. This was like a classic coming off the break performance from Liverpool. I mean, you're cagey. You're basically just not so used to. You're traveling from internationals and everything. So this is something which I was kind of expecting in a way uh, because you know we were facing a team who wouldn't sit back, uh, who against whom we've had a very kind of bad record recently, and I don't think we won against in in the last four or five games against them, right? So apart from those first ten minutes, which Which again, I was kind of expected. Uh, we grew into the game. We created chances. We didn't have that Diallo hangover from before. From before the break, so that's good. At least, and we and and the, and the best thing was we finished the two clear chances that we got. And I think we, we've created. We were on the front foot. We kind of you know we moved forward. We kind of uh, we were very expansive. So that's good. But also we didn't waste many chances, just like how we did against United. So that was something which kind of haunted us at Old Trafford. So it's good that we got that hangover off of it. And now I think we're in a pretty good place. I mean, again, I want to be optimistic. I want to say that yes, we will go and win the next nine games. But uh, again, I'm not sure, man. United, it's it's. it's I shouldn't be scared to United away. Yeah, but, but then you guys have plot armor. Um, <laughs> yeah, I I don't know. People my call money it plot armor, right now, but... right now, my money is on Liverpool. Yeah. I mean, to win and it, it yeah. makes sense, right? That they are the only team that can afford a draw, like and still be in the mix. I'm sure they'll have one of these games where they'll go five zero. Like they'll go gung ho. I mean, I think it's gonna get so close between these three teams that on their day they'll start like destroying teams because they need the Did goal. Did we ever goal. have such a close like three? Three horse I race, think. like in the Premier League. I think there it was one in my memory when Arsene Wenger was in the Arsene Wenger United and Chelsea were competing, and then I think Wenger dropped off like four games before the end. But I think there was another one when Leicester won. I think that was also very close. No, With, that was no, a that, joke, right? That yeah, was there was a season. It was close. It was there was that season where Arsenal were. Like it was first, Arsenal and only finished second in the last day, bro. Like it was no, that no, thing. Spurs were it. It was close in the middle because I remember Danny Welbeck scoring against Leicester, like last oh, yeah, minute, yeah, yeah. and we went top. And we were like, okay, now we're gonna do it. And then Tottenham was not far behind us. So that time also was close, but then again, no, yeah. that us was the thing. Bottled, bottled it. Exactly, and that day people were saying that Spurs finished third in a two horse race. <laughs> that, yeah. that, I remember that very vividly. Yeah. I think yeah. Spurs were like almost there. I remember those uh, those Simba memes which Jamie Vardy and uh, Harry. Kane were putting up like you know they were just yeah. kind of trying trolling trolling each other so i think that was that yeah apart from that like i don't remember anything man i think it was all just like yeah. either city or just city liverpool 
Animation's right, I think. Leicester beat Arsenal was the only team to beat Leicester home and away that season, and then they were top at Christmas after beating Leicester. Like it was, it was all good and everything. And by the haunting, time, haunting, haunting. Like we've been, we've been, we've trolled ourselves so much. Like just for <laughs> results, it's Dude, insane. Harry Kane has gone to Bayern. I think he's done the same thing. I think Bayern yeah. might finish third in a two-horse race. <laughs> <laughs> You know, yeah. in a runaway title, in a runaway title race, let's not be even put it two or six. At least at the beginning <laughs> of the season. But Abhinav, what do you think? Your future manager doing you a favor here? Like, who's our, tra- who's our, tra- who's our future manager? Who? Is <laughs> Derby. <laughs> Derby, no way, man. You're not here too long, bro. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you. See, that we will hire. We probably we even hire Nagelsmann, maybe, or even Thomas Tuchel, Tuchelibahn, maybe, but not De Zerbi because I I don't you think that guy though. Sorry, go ahead. Wait, didn't he just did he just admit like okay the title is gone? Yeah, it is. Oh, yeah I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> That's the guy you want. It. No, no, we, we we won't want to chill. We, we, uh, there's no way we'll kind of getting him. But Deserby, I think it's it's uh, his uh, his personality, right? And I think it, it, I don't think he's gonna work well with the honest. I mean, his recent quotes, uh, which came out, I'm not sure if you guys have read that saying. He was kind of very public about whether he wants to continue or not at Brighton. Whether I mean, saying that you know he hasn't had conversations with the manager yet or with the with the owners yet, and all of those things. And I think that is something which Liverpool will stay away from in terms of personality-wise. So it's going to be either that Ruben Amorim, sporting manager, most mm-hmm. probably, or maybe someone from left field, which who I haven't heard of and who I you know and who will we will all be behind. But I don't think it's going to be deserving. But yeah, I mean, who do you want? want it to be? Yeah, same person. Dude, we, are, we are on different mm-hmm. telepathy today. <laughs> if it's Alonso, right? I, I, I don't know if one of you guys said. I mean, it's better if he goes mm-hmm. to Madrid first because he's just gonna do like two or three mm-hmm. seasons and he's gonna fuck off, right? <laughs> That's what happens with Madrid. So then he can be at Liverpool for a longer time. Like he can have a long term. Mm-hmm. Thing. I think it is a oh, master of managing your own career. I think he will. He's gonna stay at Leverkusen, and if at all, if he wins, right, a second consecutive title, man, Ancelotti is gone. He's he's definitely Madrid bound. Yeah, yeah. yeah. no, it's it's, it's set, happened. man. I mean, I think I was chatting in the group as well, right? So this is this is perfect for Alonso. He's going to stay here, stay at Leverkusen for one more year. He'll make sure that you know they'll because he will have that agreement in place that okay, I'm going to leave the next year. You you guys find a replacement yeah. by that time. And Ancelotti, I think right now he's all. Friendship and vibes with Real Madrid, and he's doing all of those good things. And one more year, they'll have a good farewell for him because obviously he's won the league, Champions League, all double, and all of that. This season, uh, next season is when probably Ancelotti will leave. At the end of it, Real Madrid will be happy, Leverkusen will be happy, Alonso will be happy. And it's it's a good progression for yeah. him. And as Prayag was saying, and I think it's it's maybe after a couple of years or so, Real Madrid cannot have a manager for more than four or five years. So and, and Alonso will be what 47, 48 by that time, even if he stays for four or five years. And at that point of time, if Ruben Amorim Doesn't work out or whatever. Maybe that that part of Team Liverpool. That's a good place for him to come back and then to have had the mm. exposure and then come to Liverpool rather than coming now and then succeeding club. And because that itself is a huge, huge thing around your neck. Like you can't, yeah. you can't carry expectations. We need a rebound manager right now. That rebound is going to be that Ruben Amorim, whoever poor guy. I'm so sorry, but he's going to kind of either if he succeeds, awesome. If he doesn't succeed, yeah. But yeah, we have Alonso, I guess. I really wanted uh, Arteta versus Alonso, like you know. <laughs> Uh, Premier League battle for they're, they're really good friends, right? They're, they're really good friends. Childhood friends, friends yeah. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They knew each other as kids. Yeah, I think I think when Arteta was in was at Everton, Alonso and Arteta used to kind of share houses. I mean, I mean, not share houses. Like they used to live next to each other or something. Yeah, I, think. Yeah. I think it was Alonso who encouraged Arteta to come to the Premier League or something. Oh wow, okay. Yeah, they they've been really really close. Actually, this reminds me. I want to talk about one thing that I personally felt. I don't know if you guys felt it or not in the Liverpool game. The pitch, dude. You guys do something to your pitch. Everyone's slipping. <laughs> It's like it was no slipping was in the city match right in the liverpool match i don't know if you guys saw the match or not but like the ball just wouldn't move like it was it was like as if the pitch was completely dry they didn't water it just because of like you know free flowing passing team similar thing happened to arsenal like we were literally couldn't move the ball on the anfield pitch we were like hoovering it up and all of that did you feel that or am i just being I hate watching no, but, it. But why is it not a problem for Liverpool then? We are a ball playing ball playing team as well and we do it fine. You're, you're not a ball ball playing team. Like you don't build out from the back. You kind of like lay it off and to like Salah and or bring players in and then you just run with the ball. So that's a very different kind of play compared to like playing out from the back and like building it up and like slow and dynamic movements and stuff like that. 
But did okay. you do you do you feel me? Do you hear me or am I completely like okay. biased? So after this explanation, probably I'm with you. I mean, I I can see where you're coming from. I haven't personally like observed it, like you know, pitch being dry or I mean, and I think isn't that like normal? Like people kind of watering down or watering up the pitch based on how it kind of is better for your home team or something. I don't know. No, if, it is. It is. It is definitely is. But it is super evident. <laughs> yeah, it, it's evident. Okay, got it. Yeah, I mean, I think they do. I don't know. I mean, I haven't really, really like observed it. I I thought only like Klopp used to complain about these pitch and winds and things like that. But yeah, it was maybe. I'm learning from. Yeah. But isn't it isn't it crazy though? Like if that really is giving them an advantage for them to like. do that because they'll have to like train on both kind of pitches because when you're going away that is probably the norm right like so kudos to that if they're actually doing that and taking marginal advantage yeah. like it's so smart if they're actually you need to do everything you can when you have the behemoth that is city and pep <laughs> Good to say Arsenal and the Middle East, Middle East funding. You can't do anything. No, that's true. That's true. Okay, let's let's put that controversy to bed. I think every team does it if they want to. They can. So mm. that's what it is. But if City win from here, I will like personally roast all three of you for the rest of the year. By the way, just like I'm letting you all know, like you guys are there. You have the goal difference. He has the lead. Like, come on, man, close it off from here. Don't let that fourth bid happen. You know. You can't do that. You can't say that. They have. You imagine like they have two. 60 million defenders injured. They're bringing on a 90 million defender yeah. and like that, 50 that, million that other defender. They have like they, they 100 are, million winger. They have like. I mean, so you funded things. you funded that 90 million defender like by buying two players. But so that, that would mean Arsenal. We need our money back. Okay, thank you for reminding me. I need my money back for that. Whatever subscription fees I've spent in watching Arsenal, Gabriel Jesus and Zinchenko play, I need my money back. Like some two hundred dollars or something like that. Because yeah, we didn't talk about Jesus. The better it is, unless we talk about him. But yeah, I don't. Yeah, I'm so frustrated. But, but let's look at the fixtures, right? I mean, I think just in terms of like the title race and everything. I mean, yeah. I, if you have easier fixtures, man, except for Spurs. Okay, Real Madrid, Champions League. It's a different thing. Except Except for Spurs, there is nothing. They, they can walk. I mean, there is maybe Aston Villa at home. Maybe United. Uh, City, yeah, City Liverpool, don't have United. United. Liverpool, United. City, no? City, City don't have United. City, City don't have United. City, don't have, United. City, yeah, have, yeah. City have Aston Villa at home, Crystal Palace, Luton, Spurs away, which will be rescheduled to maybe the last, you know, between the pit for hmm. the last week because of their FA Cup, whatever. And then they have Forest, they have Wolves, Fulham, and West Ham. Come on, man! I mean, they can easily win all of those things. That's the thing. I mean, they could easily win everything, and then still, I wanted him to. Yes. I wanted him to, 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 to complete and be like, "Fucking look at your fixtures." <laughs> like, what are you saying? Like, what the fuck are you saying? Yeah, look at your fixtures. Okay, fine. Okay, Sheffield. Arsenal okay, has the hardest that. right now. Arsenal has the hardest. I get that. Arsenal has the hardest. Okay. Sheffield, mm-hmm. I get that. And then there's United away. I I don't know what's going to happen right now with with you know, with Man United away. This last will last Nihal in a bit. <laughs> yeah. Well, this Crystal Palace at home. Okay, fine. We'll win that. Fulham away. I don't know. Fulham has been very strong at home. So come again. on, shut up. Dude, really? <laughs> I mean, at least for us. Okay, fine. Okay. Fulham away. West Ham away. Okay. Fulham away and West Ham away. And then Everton, the one which was rescheduled because of the United match. So basically. Yeah. Fulham. So we have like three away games in space of six days or something. So Fulham away, Everton midweek, and then West Ham away at six p.m. in the morning, uh, which is again half lunchtime fixture. I don't know why they did it. And then it's Spurs home, and then okay, okay, May. Just Spurs because, home, Aston Villa because, away, and then Wolves. Just because you're making us sit while you're going through all this, I hope you lose all three away fixtures. <laughs> making these fixtures have more than they are. I mean, see. Oh, okay. Wait. By the way, City might be playing Spurs in their last game. Yeah. Last but Second. one game. That yeah. that is going to be very sus. I'm telling you right now. Like yeah. if Arsenal oh, yeah. are in a position to win, I'm telling you they'll throw the game for sure. Yeah. They'll walk off from the like, pitch, bro. Like they won't throw, but they ma- they'll purposely not start certain players. No, the crowd will be quiet. <laughs> they'll open they'll open the stadium to City fans. <laughs> they'll be like, you come. <laughs> Which means the stadium away. will be empty. In talking about throwing away, Arsenal are facing Everton at home on the last day. If yeah. there's even a slightest chance of Liverpool winning, even if they're getting relegated, they're going to yeah, throw that. But the I don't think it's going to matter. Okay, <laughs> it's Everton. Yeah. Like I don't think they're going to beat us. Yeah. But Spurs have a history of beating City, right? Yeah. yeah. So they're capable of doing it. No, but oh. uh, Abhinav, you know, if it comes down to goal difference, I completely believe that Everton will like ship in ten goals that day. <laughs> <laughs> Not even kidding. Not <laughs> this leads us to Spurs, right? Top five. Yeah. It's a lock. I think you're muted, AJ. I'm not sure. Yeah, we're not, yeah. not able to hear you. We can't hear you. So no, I was just saying this leads us to top five race, and mm-hmm. obviously I say top five because fifth place <laughs> position is mostly going to get Champions League, and I think it's probably locked now between Aston Villa and Spurs. 
What do you think? SND, you still can get it. I remember us having this chat where you can, you thought that you would be able to get it. I was, I thought you would be able to get it. I mean, it's still a, as long as it's mathematically possible, we as idiotic fans will hope that it's going to happen. It works out. And I honestly believe what Prayag said on the group chat. We consumed all of our luck that night. For us to be here with one point more than what we started in the weekend, I genuinely mean it like, there it had to be divine intervention for them to hit three four times posts and like all those chances missed onana faced 31 shots and like did not still didn't only conceded one goal and that one goal was as a result of like obvious glaring defensive mistake from our left back but yeah as long as i'm digressing but as long as we have a chance i no, think but <clears throat> it's like for united right the probability of conceding a goal increases exponentially after you guys have scored a goal like <laughs> what is going wrong yeah. there this why does that keep happening i think this was just like pure lapse of concentration this instance at least they could not believe that they scored like literally I don't think any of those 11 players could have walked back home and be like we played better I don't think anyone could have uh, could have said that mm. so I think Denmark, bro, but... <laughs> Denmark said like that <laughs> no Denmark also said that like Brentford were better what are you saying <laughs> so he always brings up random shit dude like I feel so sorry for him because if he, he's like, oh, City came here and they struggled. Liverpool came here and they struggled. Blah, 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 blah. He just does not have any answers anymore. Like his com- his favourite comeback is, I could have won at Arsenal. Yeah. <laughs> that day. You guys, he's like, oh, that you wasn't guys... offside. He's like, that wasn't offside and that was a penalty in Hoyland. I'm like, dude, move on, bro. He's like, this is league's injustice. I would have been in like top three ways now. If not for that. No, actually, <laughs> these days, whenever he gives a press conference, right? He's not talking to you guys. He's not talking to... <laughs> Like he's a, he's only putting on a show for Radcliffe. That's it. Yeah. Oh yeah, so that's a good point. Yep. He's yeah. shit scared to lose his job. I think he's to to be honest, I don't think he's as bad a manager as he is being, you know, as it is playing out in reality. But I feel like he's just shit scared of losing his job at this point and he's I, doing I everything. I think what really him. works against him, why like there is so much talk about Ten Hag is because, you know, like United got in his cronies. I mean, whatever his people from Ajax, <laughs> and it didn't work out. That's why it's. That's why like it's become so bad. Yeah. <laughs> if it wasn't like that, like it, people would you know actually be like, okay, you have to put on the players. It's not just Ten Hag. There are other issues. But in this this case, like they got a lot of people that literally was under him for many years. So this yeah. is kind of weird. Like but doesn't he know case? Martinez is prone to injury? Yeah. Like, Huh. Don't you think? Don't you think he needs to be cut a little bit slack? Given two of their centre backs, starting centre backs, got injured. No, and he should. Be, like I've always said that United should not sack Ten Hag. That they should definitely keep him on for at least one more season. But this thing really works against him. And you know what, Nihal, you guys have something positive to take away from that game. If Mount scored, like people even forgot that he's he playing exists. United. So he that's exists. good. Yeah. I, I mean, there. I think the walking away with the point is the biggest positive from that game. I genuinely believe it. Like whatever happens, like that was such a bad performance. I don't know what to make of it. Like you can't come back. You can't do what you did at Old Trafford that day and back it up with this. You know what I mean? This is the crime documentary I was talking about before during that mid-season because this in pattern of inconsistency is so fucking like predictable and annoying that I knew that it was going to be like a mood fixture. But this was this felt like the worst performance ever. Ever. like because we were not mm. pressing we were letting them play we made like Brentford look like Arsenal or City bro and that is not just <laughs> Brentford like every performance in the last 10 games every team felt that they were like a really top tier team against United because we let those teams play and this yeah. has to come down to tactics you know forget the signings forget the person forget anything like if you have 11 random bodies who are fit enough to play football you should feel a better team like you should have a better tactic to go against and um I think yeah. Manu and Rashford have had like a little bit of international hangover. They didn't have the best of I, the game. I, I personally have a problem with Rashford. I just think we should we should move on from mm. the project called Rashford because it's not I worth see it. it. Like I see it's it, not... to be honest. Yeah, I mean, like, mm. it's not worth it, to be honest, because we can genuinely, because he's paid a lot of money, it's probably time to, like, move him on if PSG come back with an offer. It makes perfect sense for United mm. to move on, and if Jim Ratcliffe has any, like, brain, he should do it. I would see a world where they would keep Ten Hag, because it's the easiest decision for them. Like, yeah. they can still rebuild everything behind the scenes, and if performances go really bad, even if we only finish Europa, at least that's not another build that 
these guys are taking because Dan Ashworth is taking a lot more time. But, but the whole thing, like, I think Jim Ratcliffe is not naive to believe that he can turn this around in a season or two. He knows that he needs like two, two, three seasons, and he doesn't have that. Basically, he's not bowling. He doesn't like walk in and like do random ass changes. I see but, a world where like Bayern Munich and United swap managers like, to avoid hmm. paying like that penalty or the money. I see a world yeah. where like that could happen, but there'll be that. That's it. Do I have? I I'm losing hope on Ten Hag day by day. Like I said, we. there's still possibility that we might have like a trophy like some randomness we might even finish in the top 5 but still won't be progress you know at best next season we'll stay stagnant we'll finish another champions league we should not renew ten hag's contract and we should think about the project yeah. no, what about no. ange though what about ange is he is he going to sustain his performances from this season to next i mean i i personally feel like one defender or one player gets injured and then the whole uh, you know whole of their fan base is about oh this player is missing that's why we're not able to play blah 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 Even this uh, he's match. good though. You have to give it to him. He's good. Like he? uh, he's a modern manager. He's good. Like it's not that easy to pull off what he did. Like okay. his first yeah. couple of games. And it's 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 about managing the image. It's about managing the brand, the fans. So he's done a good job. Yeah. yeah. I mean, right. no, don't you think he's like a perfect Liverpool manager? <laughs> no, man. <laughs> Liverpool. He could be I mean, right. I think he was a Liverpool fan, right? He was a Liverpool yeah, fan growing up or something. Yeah. yeah. In the the moment he said referees should get more time after the Diaz goal, and then I think that kind of stopped him from becoming a Liverpool manager for me, anyway. But anyway, but <laughs> so no, yeah. That's true. I mean, yeah, he. He he's a he seems like a very good man. He has a good personality and everything. But as Boss Prayag was saying, I think he what the best thing he did was develop a such style of play. You can see how Spurs are playing right now. There is an identity, and there is definitely. I mean, he's a bit rea- you know bit naive, and then you know does does he played like against a Chelsea match, right? I think he was playing with nine men. He was still kind of going for it or something and all of that. So apart from those you know brain fogs here and there, I think he's 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 a good manager. But in terms of Liverpool, um, I think if he was free, definitely he would have. Been looked in, and he, if he was kind of willing to come, but with Spurs, I think he found a good good solution for his career at this point, and I think he's stable. I think he should continue the work he's been doing, and maybe a couple of years down the line, if some things kind of align, maybe. But right now, not. He's done a very smart thing. You know what he's done? He's built like from the very beginning, he's built up political capital with the fans and the media. Yeah. So yeah. now, even when he makes a mistake, everybody goes, "It's fine," you know. Yeah. He is he is new to the league. So that's a smart thing yeah. to do. Ten Hag should learn how to be likable from this guy. No, no, <laughs> just so likable pairs with they're fun to watch. Like, yeah. Whenever they play, it's actually a lot of fun to like watch that football game because of how like expansive they are. I've never seen some any team like be that. That's stupid. Like you can't win the league with that. mentality but it's just commendable that like he comes to a league where it's already so hard and like you know loses Harry Kane and still like be is very ballsy the first few fixtures worked in his favor and all these things right he's a smart guy so it built that capital with the media and with everyone and moved on but like i I'm, think he's- they're the only team other than united that like where if i watch the football games i know that something will happen yeah like, there is going to be like something that's happening like either some sort of drama because they they have no concepts of like the traditional back four back three or whatever mm-hmm. this go for it bro and it's it's nice i think he's also adapted right a little bit like yesterday substitution were a little bit more pragmatic i saw a little yeah. bit more of like you know conservatism from his substitutes and his overall approach to the game which obviously we hadn't seen in the first half of the season where he was like oh ultra a high line if somebody is missing i'll play player people out of position not being conservative if i'm leading so i think that also i mean as you said he's learning and adapting as as and when he's he's getting experienced in the league and the widest man is always that full back their attackers yeah. never go that wide they're always like so their attacks are so concentrated from the center that like the wide man if anyone's there that's just the left backs or right backs the full backs that go that wide and it's like once they turn over the position once the other team turns over the position they are a genuine threat because they really move quickly so <laughs> for me i think spurs are a top 5 lock if anyone's dropping point it has to be like villa and their inexperience and like those nerves that come down to it but i feel like spurs the good thing that spurs have is the next 5 6 fixtures are winnable and the tough ones yeah. come to the end and in the next 5 6 united have really tough ones like where yeah. it could just break their tops so they could arrive with these last fixtures with like nothing more to lose you know they would have locked one of those two positions and i think that's good for everyone including you guys that are playing them then so 
should uh, that that should be interesting so it is aston villa if pune emery guides aston villa to no actually that's not good we want spurs to be in a position where they have to win when they're facing city to be in the top four yeah like i think you have a bigger <laughs> like concern against liverpool than city you're ahead of city at this point and i think that will stay that way for yeah, you guys city catch, right yeah fair two points ahead oh. at one point fair. but like if if pune emery guides aston villa to top 5 4 champions league basically does he like will any big team take a punt on him next season given the number of vacancies that there are barcelona bayern and number of vacancies that there are does he deserve another chance after psg arsenal i think he's comfortable where he is man i think unai emery uh, i think i don't know i think with arsenal he got found out because it was too big of a club for him and again his tactics sometimes you know didn't, didn't just kind of match uh, with psg as well that barcelona 6 again all of these embarrassments and all of that so i i think he kind of again i think after psg he went to villarreal or sevilla yeah villarreal villarreal, villarreal. No, sorry. villarreal, villarreal. 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 Yeah, he won the Europa League oh, there. Real would remember. Yeah. Oh yeah, Villarreal and then Real would remember. Yeah, the Digia penalty, right? So and after and after that, I think he came to Aston Villa. I'm thinking he's he found his level. And Aston Villa are not one of those are not Brighton or West Ham or anything. They they are investing a lot. If you look at the number of players that they want to they spent on players and the investment in general, they've been doing that a lot. And I think they're they're this close to breaching FFP as well. I mean, again, hopefully they won't do that. But I'm just saying they're kind of investing a lot. And I think it's a good Good place for Emery to stay at least for a season and see if we can build on that and maybe he something will come out of it. But even personally, I think Emery it suits him. It suits him to not have so many expectations well, on what, him. What do you think about Chelsea? Chelsea is a graveyard for managers, man. Chel- yeah. I know, but then mm-hmm. you know they're willing to offer twenty million, thirty million, whatever to these <laughs> managers. So. I mean, I can see if you want to. I mean, it is just my opinion that Emery. I think it suits him. It suits him and the club that he'll stay one more season. But if Chelsea come in and say, okay, we're going, we're going to kind of disrupt everything again and if Funa Emery wants to go and take a punt I think he's free to I don't think he'll succeed there but Aston Villa would be the best bet for him Nihal would you take him mm-hmm. at United? Uh, I don't know I don't think so like, no? It's, no, I mean, no more good evening for you? No more good evening for me No thank you uh, I don't know Um, I don't think I know I very well know like what kind of manager that I want at United I think that is partly down to the reason why I'm like not so happy to jump on the Ten Hag out train because if, I've, if I'm jumping on that train that means that I'm rooting for my season to go like bust let's, let's hope and the with with unai the problem is at big clubs when the personalities get b- bigger than him i don't know if he can he's a good man manager in that aspect and i think psg and arsenal were both places where that's the thing that didn't work out maybe for him and yeah. uh, i think at aston villa he'll grow with aston villa i think yeah. that's a good thing for him sensible decision is for him to stay there but like prag mentioned uh, chelsea does random things sometimes and if they come mm-hmm. in with like a 30 million per year payday it might it can tempt anyone you know like 30 million per year is a big payday in london like it's a force of corruption in the league chelsea <laughs> we'll get there we'll get there hold your hold your horses we have we will we'll get there but i think i think unai emery's unai emery and even ten hag's biggest downfall is their management of media i think yeah. their lack of media presence and their lack of ability to convey their thoughts as well as by time from media kind of plays against them it's just yeah unai emery had a disaster class in doing it at arsenal yeah. and probably I mean, tenhag is the same the the problem is for tenhag results never like started off the way that he ever expected like anj was lucky that like you know he started off with such wins so many wins in the beginning he was undefeated for like nine games right like the first nine games so mm-hmm. not lost yeah, yeah. yeah. why is he a lot of like purchase in media like eric ten hag started his career with like two big l's in the premier league yeah, time yeah it takes time to like you'll never recover sometimes you need your luck and like you know the first impressions do matter especially like when you're yeah. striking the bond with media and kudos to arteta for actually overcoming all of that because there's a big media bias against arteta and he was on the ledge yeah Right, like right. so yeah. it came very and close to being sad weirdly sad. enough weirdly enough klopp didn't have the performances in the beginning but he still like got some purchase because he was like yeah. he's how is a different animal he's charismatic as fuck he's like a different people animal people like klopp yeah right? yeah so that's totally different yeah okay what's your final top 4 top 5 predictions uh, i think we'll stay like this in my opinion um, v- villa and tottenham Will and Dortmund won't change. Yeah. yeah, I think Spurs will finish fourth and Villa fifth. Yeah, yeah, I don't know the order, but those two for me too. Sorry. Uh, cool, cool. I think so. From top five to a team that probably will never finish top five in the next five season. Priya, what do you think of Chelsea's FFP situation? And basically, a time for you to rant. No, I'm actually more confused. I think 
the guy speaking to you earlier about this they say that chelsea need to sell players by, by what june 30th june yeah yeah okay so from what i understand even if so this is based on the decisions that they made last season like in the summer transfer window and the winter transfer window so yeah. so even if this season were perfect right and they are top of the league and they are i think they are already in the fa cup semi finals right so yeah. nothing they they, they weren't even in the europa so that is not going to change and i think it, we don't have to consider the carling cup in this equation that they would have won it or something but apart from that okay they are top of the league and they are in the fa cup semi final and even if they finish the season okay obviously they are not going to win it but they finish on the top 4 i don't think they would have gotten any money that would have made things different they would still be in the same financial situation so what was the initial plan so i think the argument here Or is am i wrong in my understanding because no, no, i don't no, think the ufa right. money comes so soon i think it comes at the end of the season or something like that no no you're absolutely right you're absolutely bang on i think the idea what all idea was like if this season they can get europa at least so hmm. at least by the end of next season they can get that uh, you know europa league revenue in or whatever that european revenue hmm. in and this season basically summer of 20 they can survive by just selling off a few of those players right so like let's say 100 million sell four players for 100 million and then all of the amortization costs or ffp costs have been covered for this season and then next season because they're in the because they're in european competition they'll be able to cover it next season but now given their problems and their situation right now obviously they have to sell this season but then next season also they're not in europe or even if they are it wouldn't lead to any significant amount of money because conference league probably won't get you anywhere so the next season at the end of next season they will have to sell the players again and who's to say how the performance will be next season given like how strong arsenal city other teams are right in the league liverpool other teams are so but it kind okay, of it becomes like a rolling barrel let's forget about the future let's just yeah. think about this this particular thing that whatever the quagmire they are in right now so what was the plan at that time were they thinking you know what we'll have a good season certain players like reese james and galaga are going to play really well and we are going to be able to sell them for a very high price so is that their plan like in like imagine last year they decided in- like we're going to do well these players are going to play well and we're going to sell them to cover the cost of all the new players that we bought right now like i don't understand like what imagine did- i'll tell you in this hmm. scenario imagine replace chelsea with tottenham right hmm. so if you go ahead and sell try to sell Tottenham's players they will probably i mean they're not in top they're they're not challenging for the title right but they are in and around they're top 4 top 5 top 6 whatever so if chelsea players perform to the same level and given the amount mm. of money that they've spent let's say palmer mm. right if they were to go and sell palmer next season it'll probably go for like mm. 70 80 90 whatever you want to ask for him right so if the idea was yeah. in my head that's what i'm thinking like just giving them the benefit of the doubt that if they had performed even significantly not significantly but like even a little bit better cohesively and shown their skills they could have sold those players in the like for example broya you know that broya is not going to be in your first team but if he had scored in let's say 6 7 8 goals he could have gone for like 30 million next season i mean right now you won't even pay 10 million for broya you'd be like so, yeah. so that was the plan like oh it should have been the plan kid, I mean, this, kid palmer, this kid cold farmer this kid cold farmer who is uh, 19 years old who's hardly played football he's going to be so insane we're going to sell him for yeah. and this guy broha who also has been underwhelming he's going to suddenly become good this season and we're going to sell him for 40 what kind of planning is that That's like, stupid. How does it make any sense? Does not. So the basically and, hedged and, bets. So just one point. So it's a basically hedged bets on selling on selling a player, thinking that okay, these guys will magically kind of you know exponentially yeah. be yeah. somewhere in value without giving them a platform to develop. How yeah. brain dead yeah. is that? Like and and are, I guess they yeah. didn't bring into the equation the fact that everybody knowing that Chelsea has to offload so and so players will bring down their value because of. Just the market forces, right? Yeah. The demand yeah. and supply. So they didn't. I think they didn't account for any of that. It was some hedge fund guys giving a PPT, showing a PPT toward Bali, and then he's like, "Yeah, yeah, that's it." I think that's what happened. And also euros, right? Like, imagine how many clubs hold back their budgets yeah. just because from for like breakout euro stars, there'll be a youngster from Romania killing it, and they'll be like, "Oh yeah, let's get him." So they'll be saving like twenty million for twenty million for that guy, and they won't be spending. I think, I think someone euros. in the boardroom must have brought up that point, and they kicked him out of the room. Yeah. <laughs> like why is this guy that being so negative cool. man that was too cool i mean no matter okay, whatever it is i am definitely thoroughly enjoying it like i just i've had so many of like those wenger mourinho moments i hate that club so much that i am actually enjoying their fate and it, all of it is like brought on to themselves by, by their own doing so 
great but but would you say that uh, they have increased the economic equality or reduced the economic inequality the financial inequality in the premier league by uh, just throwing money around yeah by being like, so stupid know, right like just, just uh, <laughs> splashing their credit card around like they just went and like categorized themselves in the mid like no one buys a club at top level it was level a in- wealth transfer <laughs> it was a large wealth transfer yeah, they're, they're <laughs> the robin hoods yeah, yeah the I mean, stupid like, robin hoods <laughs> the premier league <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, it's kind of like a circle, right? It's a karmic. I mean, not to get into like a lot of spirituality and ideology and all of those things, but it's a karmic circle. Like they inflated the Premier League and the mm-hmm. wages and the transfer fees, everything in the first place into the people whenever they came on. So uh, maybe it's it's one of those things that it's coming back to bite them. But uh, yeah, that's all we can do, bro. That's all. That's all Wenger has taught us. Being philosophical. That's all we know. I think I'm definitely enjoying this Chelsea don't for AJ to do what you what you said. My my yeah. hate for Chelsea is very organic. Like you know, it, it's not it's not manufactured like how I have it for United, right? Because United, yeah. I was told that I should hate United. As a Liverpool yeah. fan, I should hate United. That is basically like there's that saying. Past- there's that saying, right? I yeah. hate United because I'm an Arsenal fan. Yeah. I hate Chelsea yeah. because I'm a human being. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I'm saying this is it's very. I mean, he, Chelsea basically are a model club for me. Okay, this is what a club shouldn't do, and this is how. a club should you know you, should, you can just hate a club for right and everything mm. that they've done from starting from Mourinho era everything that they've done even and the 20, i would the also argue champion. they started mm-hmm. this tradition of like such like very high manager turnover yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. firing yeah. managers yeah no i think that's basically it i think they have been this club which i love to hate and i'm glad this is happening to them so yeah okay. long may it continue i guess yeah it's so funny like that one war in ukraine affected the only <laughs> affected like a club from south like london the most and ukraine didn't actually i'm, I'm not saying ukraine is a fault but whatever because of ukraine this happened and it wasn't done yeah it was going to be something really politically incorrect <laughs> No, 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 no. Because Mikhailo Mudrik, right? They paid hundred million for him. So the Ukraine saga continues. I don't know what he what he did say. Like Chelsea board were having a meeting. Like, how do we make the, our cul- club's cultural history correct? Like, let's spend hundred million on the Ukrainian PR problem solved. Like, oh my god. How can we screw Arsenal and also be culturally correct at the same time? Let's get Mudrik. Uh-huh. <laughs> okay, so from one hundred million signing to another potential hundred million signing, Ivan Tony. I saw hmm. beard rumors this morning that. West West Ham, out of all the possible clubs, have agreed a deal for Ivan Tony. Agreed as in like it was not agreed as in like it's obviously it's a rumor, so don't it's not from a credible source. It's like one of those Twitter things that goes around. But that kind of made me think. Firstly, are West Ham that bigger club that they can compete with Arsenal, United, possibly Chelsea in terms of firstly money, but also stature. But secondly, where would he fit in? Anybody uh, want? Do you guys think? feel like there is a larger force of selling in the upcoming transfer window than buying? Like, I think most clubs is going to wait around and. See, it's not going to be a situation like people are going to be waiting to buy players. Yeah. I think nobody is like no club is like with money is right now lacking players. Yeah. It's kind of weird. Lot, lot, of, lot of the clubs. There's more emphasis for clubs to like offload players, like United, mm-hmm. Chelsea, and stuff like that. And I think other clubs also know. And it's time to for them to like be smart. Even Brentford, right? Like they went and signed a 30 million striker in anticipation that they'll sell Tony. So <laughs> in their minds, they at least need to get like 50 to 60 million, like to rationalize yeah. or like to spend more money on another player. So they've already accounted for a Tony transfer. Like yeah. I think. Buying clubs have to be like smart this time. I think this will be the opportunity of window of like a smart, to bring a hmm. smart. I think I think price correction is going on right now. Yeah. Like I agree. What happened the last window because of Chelsea? <laughs> I think it's getting correction right now. I think they and, and they will fold face the brunt of it most of, of it right because they won't be able to sell. Because of Chelsea, Liverpool and Arsenal both dodged like huge bullets, bro. Like big bullets. I'm not. <laughs> Like uh, this is why it's beautiful, right? Not only are they going down, but they are pushing us up <laughs> while doing it. Uh, but jokes aside, Abhinav, do you think that like Tony will fit at Arsenal? I don't think they'll ever agree that. Like, I think Arsenal urgently needs to replace Jesus, and I think yeah. Tony is a good fit. Yeah, I think exactly. I am. Agreeing, I'm. I'm never not agreeing to that. Like, Jesus is a good worker. <laughs> he's a good worker, right? He is a. He'll do. Oh, he's a much dude. The shoveling. Like, he'll just run around with the bricks and everything. He's not an architect. Like fuck him. Like, I'm like done. if you if you like make a compilation of the entire time Jesus has been on screen, right? It will be him pouting like, mm, like <laughs> that's it. Like fifty percent. 
ghar bhi tha first swimming first oh. swimming from right to left from then left to right then right to left then people are standing up getting down <laughs> trying to attack him trying to figure out when he'll shoot and then he'll won't shoot but that's a weird <laughs> thing like he's not bad he's not a bad player he's good like He's, he's not wasteful. like it's not even that he's wasteful, but then it's not like he's getting easy chances. But maybe he should try to make chances more easier. He shouldn't be trying to make it more like too complicated, and then he's missing a difficult chance. You can do something else to make your chance easier, and then maybe miss it or score a goal. But what he does is every time he's in a position, right? Instead of going in a straight line, he tries to do something else, <laughs> and then he's in an even more difficult position, and he tries to take a shot which is like decent. It won't be too bad. So it's kind of very weird. You can't judge this guy. I can totally. to relate to that with darwin nunes i'm not <laughs> kidding that's exactly what he does nunes and i'm and i'm <laughs> And given how Nunes and Diaz have been performing this season, I mean they've they've been okay, they've been good, but again they've not to the expectations. Diaz that Diaz is had. pretty good, man. I, Diaz, like, I'm always impressed when I see him. He's pretty good. I think we see him more and more, and so I can I can see all his faults as mm-hmm. well in in terms of mm-hmm. because today there was one good chance where he could have, he could have squared to Salah or Nunes and he didn't do that. I mean he always doesn't lift his head. He he doesn't see for the good pass and all that. But to your answer to answer your questions, I, I mean, but I feel have, like he's a very hard worker. Like he's oh, yeah, always he is, into he it. Both of them are. Both Nunes and mm-hmm. Diaz, both of them are. It's just that the output is missing, and I think that's mm-hmm. where I think Tony actually could help Liverpool. Maybe yeah. given mm-hmm. where we are, and we haven't had Tony, an English, English striker in a while. Tony's Tony is like a straight shooter, fan. right? Yeah, exactly. He's a Liverpool He's like fan. He's like a no bullshit straight shooter. Point. So, and I think that kind of directness will help Liverpool a lot. Mm-hmm. And I think. So was it, who was the last one? Was it Michael Owen? Have you had an English striker after Michael Crouch. Owen? Crouch. Andy Carroll. Andy Carroll. Crouch. 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 Andy Carroll. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah Andy Carroll. And after that, who? Ben no. Teke. You had Ben Teke also, but he's Belgian. And ben Teke. You built one in Dominic Solanke and sold a really good like mid-table player. To yeah, yeah. He was. Uh, yeah, he, he was. We sold it. It was too early for him. And you guys, you guys got twenty million profit, which is like a brilliant move business for. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think we just kind of bought him, kind of made him play like three or four games, and I think that was all Michael Edwards, man. I think that guy is kind of literally looting everyone at that point. But yeah, I think Tony would be an amazing fit for Arsenal and a good fit for Liverpool. Uh, yeah. We basically swap Jesus and have him in, in your uh, in your starting eleven. And you know what? City won't be in contention for this guy. I don't think no, so. No, no, no. Yeah. Halo, no so that Halo is going to make Halo and Alvarez. No, they won't be yeah. in contention. So, so I think Tony will be priced well because City and Chelsea are not in the equation. Good, so Chelsea are. I think Chelsea. <laughs> I mean, financially they might not be, but uh, according to their grand plan, they are. You can put Chelsea's name against any player, man. You can put a fourth choice goalkeeper. They are in contention for everyone. So yeah. I think they are. They are just kind of. They're, they're they're hoping for this magical market place to in open. Any any gems we can swoop up in the fire sale or any other club from the Chelsea fire sale. I think Gallagher. Where would Gallagher be good? Hmm. I think he's going to. I don't think any other club takes Gallagher on. What about hmm. Reese James? I mean, he's too injury prone though. I think to be honest, I won't lie. I would take Mudrik. I think not because of Mudrik as a player, but because I feel like Arteta has this ability to turn wingers. But we'll into... also we'll also get a more humble Mudrik if he comes to Arsenal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like like For sure. he'll be more willing to listen to Arteta. He won't be coming high. More, more domesticated. Like yeah. he'll. Yeah. Nico Jackson Nihal for your they'll go back to Brentford and be like take Nico Jackson for Brent uh, for Tony be like Tony originally was 60 million now is 70 million <laughs> <laughs> He's a prize on it. That's such a waste of space. But anyway, like Prague's point. I think there'll be like interesting to see what Chelsea does, and I think Chelsea might end up being a feeder club for a lot of these West Ham's, Brighton's, like and stuff like that, mm. where they'll go in for twenty million, pick any player. The Robin Hood story continues. <laughs> you know what? Like, if I was Arsenal, right? If I was Edu, you know what I would do? If I wanted Tony, I would leak certain things into the media, like. I would make up stories that he's still a gambler. You know, <laughs> he's been spotted gambling in this casino, whatever, which is not oh, illegal. Funny. It's that's legal, funny. but that means that he. I know, but you can gamble in a casino, right? That's fine. That's not sports betting. But then you put these stories out there, and then we go for him when the controversy is going on. Yeah. yeah, I think I think we won't get Tony because it's not about the ability. I think he's superbly talented. Uh, mm. I think it's only because of his outwardness, like you know, and how outspoken he is in the press. Mm. I think that kind of hinders his chances at Arsenal. Yeah. But yeah. anyway, good segment, boys. That's a wrap. We'll mm. just end it here. Unless you guys have anything else to talk about referees and anything. I think it's a bit it's late. A waste of time, man. Referees. I mean, it's a waste. But what was that fucking penalty? For Newcastle, right? that was fucking shit. Yeah. So okay. anybody can. So anybody like if a foul happens, right, you can go either way. Because what yeah. is what does a foul mean anymore? 
Did you see? Did you see Chelsea's penalty? I mean, it was even more hilarious. Yeah, I didn't see it. I'll have to take a look. Bro, you should, you should. Penalty and a red card. Insane. You would love it. <laughs> hey, <laughs> how how is that a penalty? And and again, it's it's David England, man. That guy, he does some crazy shit and he doubles down on it. <laughs> same guy, same guy who gave same guy who who gave the red card, who didn't give the offside for Luis Diaz goal. He was he was the VAR that day. You fucked up. No, but okay. At there there is emotions and pull like you know Liverpool. Pool was a city game. They uh-huh. released the audio, the conversation between the referee and the VR mm-hmm. thing. So the referee is like, "You're not a penalty, not a penalty, not a penalty." He says it three, four times, and the guy is like, "One guy, the one guy is like, oh yeah, I think we should take a look." But the other guy is like, "Ah, oh, no, I agree, I agree." There's contact with the ball. There was, I don't think, uh, yeah. who was it? A Doku. He didn't touch McAllister. the ball. He didn't, he didn't touch, touch it. No, the ball yeah, came off was... of McAllister's chest. He didn't. Yeah, he, but then they're later. saying with so much confidence that it's not like independent organizations. It's like, ha, my friend, ha, he's saying it. Ha, ha, you're right, bro. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you that that entire clear and obvious, that high degree of error and all all of that shit. It, it's it's just made up things, man. I'm telling you, they are just trying to see how best they can still have influence on the game, and that's about it. Because no, if, but I think yeah. we should go for. comes razor which is incompetence this is all the entire thing and or maybe corruption I mean it's a big allegation so you can't make it without like proper proof but if it's not corruption i think it's just incompetence they're all mates they all want to protect each other yeah. some people make mistakes yeah they admitted themselves even those guys i think mike dean and and i think clattenburg whoever who are not refereeing now who are kind of retired referees they admitted that themselves that okay yeah we don't want to kind of make him look out make him look like a, a fool in on the field so that's why mm. i mean he, he he was our mate so we'll just kind of give him the benefit of doubt or yeah, we won't I'm, want I'm, for his kids birthday you know yeah. we had a pint together wouldn't be right <laughs> to call him out yeah but that was an extreme situation i understand that error but these decisions are like dude first of all these these decisions shouldn't have been made like that penalty the, the west ham and newcastle game I, that wasn't mm-hmm. a penalty and that changed the whole game exactly yeah. Com- change the dynamic of the game um, right like and what's the point of var right i mean you look at it at least yeah. in a in a normal way and then say okay fine yeah you take a look again but they find every possible reason even a slight touch of the foot even something they should make it the separate institution it yeah. should be like like in the us you have internal affairs nothing like that right mm-hmm. it should be like separate and there should be like some conflict between them they shouldn't be like together seeing each other in the office every day they should be totally yeah. separate so that and they have, they have an incentive not to all is agree yeah. but at that is going to disrupt the flow of the game is what they say because if those institutions are fighting against each other our viewing experience mm. is going to be disrupted that's why we are going to have a very high bar and we will not kind of disturb the flow and we'll let the game continue it's again it's all made up rules which they're kind of finding they've kind of spun a web amongst themselves that is a valid point that is yeah, a so, valid point but i think that they can do better than whatever they're doing now with yeah, hundreds exactly. of millions of dollars at their disposal this can't be the final solution the thing that i can't and stomach is that the benefit of doubt for the on field like referee is mm-hmm. something that i can't wrap my head around the reason being is that any day we are is more equipped with like all the videos all the angles slow motion fast everything else so benefit of doubt should not should never be a question like you should never give the benefit of doubt to the on field referee only, only if it's a, something you can't judge from var also mm-hmm. then you I go mean, with the on field referee yeah i mean like i get it but like any foul var should be able to like clearly override like the on field referee and that yeah. still okay if that's a standard that is followed across that that will make it easier than like oh the referee thought it's not a foul he already gave that decision on field let me just like you know wipe with it because that that could also be true i don't think this gray area ness should be should uh, should not exist anymore and there should be like actually black and white decisions from we yeah, are just interrupt and blows my mind is you know liverpool's thing the offside thing was i mean it's the worst possible thing that could happen right from an official yeah, but that was the communication error that was an actually no, no, but like yeah, close yeah. to close to that was yesterday the second year low firstly you're giving a non penalty a penalty and secondly over the time there's a talk about not adding a double jeopardy but you're sending the player off okay you made a mistake you send him off in the second yellow like we are saw that image and they know that it's not a penalty but okay we're not going to read every the game whatever just overturn the yellow i mean come on guys like this it is such a grave impact of when you're playing 11 versus no, but 10. i'm fairly confident it will be resolved in 3 to 4 years like it'll happen it'll yeah. be resolved it's just that it for us it's frustrating that we have to go through this for Certain amount of time, but it'll be because it's a large organization with like so much money involved. It will get fixed. 
Yeah. Like it, has to. it won't not get fixed because referees are not that powerful. They may be powerful, but they're not more powerful than the big money, right? So yeah. money is coming from the fans. Beyond a certain point, the money will talk. So it will get fixed, but then we have to sit through it while it's getting fixed. 